Hey, Pastor Jeremy here. Thank you so much for tuning in to what we hope is a great tool for you to utilize and to grow you in your walk with Jesus. Now, before we get started here, we want to invite you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done that. And then also hit that notification bell so that whenever we post stuff throughout the week, you'll get notification of it so you can use that resource to your benefit, but also you can share it with your friends and family as well. And then also we want to direct you to our website at fbcac.org, where you can find out more about our church family, uh, our different ministries, and then what God is doing and, and how he's using us to impact the kingdom here in Angels Camp, California. Now, here we go. We're about to get into the word of God proclaimed. Please feel free to leave a, a prayer request or, or a comment in the section below. Thank you guys so much for joining with us today. God bless you, and we love you. So, again, we're continuing on in our study of of Jesus' high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, comes on the heels of his upper room discourse, John chapters 13 through 16, and it's this personal prayer time, right? We get this insider's look into this amazing, personal, intimate time between Jesus and the Father. We know through the Gospels that Jesus prayed a lot, but we never really get a glimpse of what he prayed about. Here's the glimpse, right? Here's the picture. And as we've already looked at for the last couple weeks, it is an amazing prayer, a prayer that what we said uh, two weeks ago, this is actually the true Lord's Prayer, right? Because this is a prayer that only he can pray, right? The Lord's Prayer of Matthew chapter 6 that we're all used to, we pray that, right? But Jesus, it would be unfitting for Jesus to pray that prayer. And yet we find him in this prayer of just amazing attentiveness to his nature as God, sharing in the glory of God. And now he's praying for his chosen people, right? The people that have been chosen by the Father, given to him um, for eternal life. And he's now emphasizing that he's praying for them, right? He's not praying for the world at this point. He is praying for his people. They belong to the Father since all that the Father has that uh, has been given to the Son, they now belong to the Son as well. And so again, the, his, his people, his chosen people, the elect of God are the focus of his prayer uh, as we continue on. Um, and, and then as we considered last week, it, it kind of comes to this crescendo of sorts where he says, may they be one, even as you and I are one. And so this unity of the church, this unity within the body of Christ is what Jesus is really trying to uh, uh, just pour over his disciples. And please understand, um, when we talked about last week, the essentials of the faith, that we should be united around the essentials of the faith. I mean those things that are essential to salvation, right? Essential to be saved, essential to be a born-again Christian, Christian, uh, 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 essential to be a member of the body of Christ. That's what we looked at um, briefly, right? And it was, again, uh, by way of answering three questions. Who is God? Who is Jesus? And what has he done? And then how can I be saved? Those essentials of the faith is what Jesus is really driving. No, we must be united around those things. Anything outside of that has various levels of importance and then various levels of unity as well. So who is God? He is the triune Godhead that has eternally existed. One God in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Focusing in on the Son who is the co-equal, co-eternal uh, Son of God. He came in bodily form, was born of a man, or born as a man, <laughs> born of a woman. It's not that kind of church. Um, and <laughs> lived a sinless life, right? Died a death that you and I should have died. Uh, was buried in the ground. Three days later, he rose bodily from the grave. He ascended to heaven bodily, and one day he will come again bodily to judge the living and the dead. Those are the essentials of who God is, who Jesus is, and what he's done. And so that's great, but now how do I apply that to me? How do I get saved? And we know that the gospel says you are saved by grace through faith, period. Amen? Not of works, not of anything that you can do, so that none of us can boast when we get into heaven. Those are the core essentials that I believe Jesus is saying, I want my people to be united around these things. May they be one, even as I and the Father are one. And I believe to be a Christian, you must believe in these essential truths. And Jesus' prayer at this point is that we be united around these things. And also, you could say up until this point, 
Jesus has now prayed for things that, in a, in a sense, have already transpired. Isn't it amazing that often when Jesus talks, or even Paul talks about that, we'll look at in just a bit, he talks about future events as if they are already happening, right? As if they are already a sure thing. He says that we have, or he has already been glorified by God. He's praying for the people whom he's been given. He's already been given them. And they stand united as one, just as the Father and Jesus are one. And so he's talking as if these things are already so. But now in today's context, as we'll see, Jesus kind of close out the end of his prayer in today's message. And then we'll see in the, in the, in the last message, Jesus prays for things to come in the lives of of the believer. So he, it's almost as if he moves from past tense, this is already established, to now this is what I'm praying for them in the future. And in a sense, we've been given a picture, an overview. If you really break it down, we're looking at salvation. Jesus is kind of laying out the formula, if you will, for salvation. Salvation begins with the glory of God. Amen? Everything begins with the glory of God. The, God, the glory of God is, is not contingent on anything or anyone else. It's not dependent on you and me. If we don't wake up uh, tomorrow morning and give glory to him, guess what? He is still glorified. He is still worthy to be praised, whether we feel like it or not. So God's glory is not contingent. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have all shared in that glory for all eternity. They don't need anyone else to recognize it. Okay? <laughs> they are fully glorified in and of themselves. However, they have chosen to reveal their glory in creation. And it's through the salvation of the elect of God that we are focusing in on today. In other words, God's glory is powerfully shown through his son's sacrifice on the cross for the sins of the world, so that as many who come to faith in him will be saved. So salvation begins with God. It is then gifted to man through faith. But salvation does not end there. Keep that in mind. Salvation does not end there. In fact, there are several steps, if you will. I, I don't like using the word steps because it, it it's tough to describe this divine principle. But give me some grace if I use some words that you might not quite agree with. But there are several steps in the salvation of human beings that actually make salvation not just a one-time thing in history, but a process. It's a process, in a sense, over time. And, and I'm going to flesh that out a little bit more. So through what we've covered in John 17 so far, we've been given actually the first few steps of this process of salvation. In general, the salvation of mankind can be broken down into six steps. These are in your outlines. We're going to go through this very quickly. Um, so hopefully you can stay with me. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. So... Of the six steps, five of them are clearly mentioned in a letter that Paul wrote to the Romans. Okay, so in Romans chapter 8, he's kind of laying out salvation in an orderly fashion. And in verse 29, he says this. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so in the process of salvation, this kind of step orderly fashion of, of multi-step uh, fashion of salvation in Romans 8, we kind of get this, this picture uh, of what Paul is trying to communicate that coincides with what we're reading in John 17. And it's kind of this picture of the process of salvation in your outlines. And it, and it just kind of goes in orderly fashion and Paul lays out. There's foreknowledge. That leads to predestination, which then leads to calling, which then leads to justification, and lastly, glorification. And if we were to take a look at this list, we can say that we're pretty much already through these five steps, at least the first four. Um, in Jesus' high priestly prayer. He's already talked about the foreknowledge that God has chosen a people and he's given them to the Son. He's, he's predestined them. He, Paul says that they are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. They have been called, right? They've been called out of darkness and into God's glorious light, and they have been justified. They have been justified through what? Faith, just like our father Abraham, right? 
just like Abraham, we are justified by faith, and we are wait, awaiting ultimate glorification when we step into glory. But in the context of what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 8, there's actually a, a step, if you will, that he leaves out. And he's not leaving it out because he got it wrong. He's leaving it out. He left it out because it doesn't fit the context of what he's been talking about in Romans 8. In context, he's talking about what has already happened through the sealing of the, of the Holy Spirit in the life of the child of God, right? And so he speaks as though these things are already done. They're already finished, right? We have already been foreknown. We have already been predestined and called and justified and, in a sense, glorified because of the saving work of Jesus Christ. And so, again, this is all past tense, but there's one aspect of salvation that we're going to look at today that is present tense and it's future and it's ongoing. So it wouldn't necessarily fit that Paul would mention it in this list. However, we get a glimpse of it now in John chapter 17, and it's this process by which we are sanctified. Okay? We're going to talk about sanctification today. This is the process, the, the day-by-day kind of the grueling up and downs of life in which we are conformed to the image of Jesus. And uh, this aspect is what I believe John, uh, Jesus is kind of drawing out in his high priestly prayer. So just before we get into the into the scripture, let, let's just quickly identify what is what is sanctification. What, what is that word? Well, in your outlines, it's that Greek word hagiadzo. Hagiadzo literally means to make holy. So you are made holy, and it's not anything that you do. It's what's been done to you and for you and through you. You are consecrated, right? To consecrate to. To, to devote something to a, a religious a commitment, for religious use, for holy use. This is what it means to sanctify. It's the idea of being set apart from the rest of the world so that we can be used by God for his glory and for his good purpose. Okay? And our sanctification, this is multifaceted. Sanctification happens at once, and it happens over a lifetime. Okay, So you are sanctified when you are saved by grace through faith. Bam! You are sanctified. But then you are also progressively sanctified over your lifetime. right? So some of you, in a sense, are more sanctified than I am because you've been around longer, because you've been doing this longer. Maybe you know more. right? You're further along in the process. So let's take a look at the text together to kind of get an idea of the sanctifying power of God in our lives. And, and we, well, we'll see what we can pull out from Jesus' high priestly prayer. John chapter 17, we are now in verse 12, and we're going to read to verse 19. This is the word of our Lord. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. And as we're going to learn today, your word sanctifies us. So please, Holy Spirit, have your way with our hearts and our minds. Please, right now. Block out any distractions. Block out the cares of life and of this world that we've been hampered by over the last week. Help us enter into this time with clear minds and open hearts to receive your word and to be changed by it. Lord, we love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So um, there are many things by which we are sanctified in our lifetime, right? We just took some time to list them all, and for you guys to share, we could be here all day if you guys wanted to share what has sanctified you over a lifetime, but these can include, like, personal experiences, right? 
many personal experiences sanctify us. They make us more like Jesus, certainly through prayer. The more time we spend in prayer, certainly the more sanctified we become through spiritual disciplines that we've talked about over the years. You know, just practicing those spiritual disciplines that we find in Scripture to discipline our mind and our heart and obedience to God. Uh, godly Christian relationships and discipleship. Man, those are, those are crucial, absolutely crucial to, to, to our own sanctification. And all of these work together in conforming us into the image of Jesus so that we can be used by God for his goodwill, for his good purposes. However, Jesus seems to focus in on, on one thing above all else in this text that uniquely sanctifies us, and it's the word of God. This is the word of God. Amen. And if you pay attention, he's making reference to the word of God throughout this section of the prayer, right? Scripture is being fulfilled in verse 12. He mentions his spoken word in verse 13. In verse 14, he says that he has given his chosen people the words of the Father. 17 and 18, he directly prays that God's people would be sanctified in truth. And what is truth but God's word? All right, so the word of God is heavily emphasized now in Jesus' high priestly prayer. And this continues to be one of the most in, 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 difficult things to master. And yet it, it is truly one of the most fruitful things in our lives is to be a studier and to be a doer of God's word. Highly, highly valuable. And yet isn't it difficult sometimes just to remain consistent, just to remain even like impassioned and, and, and desire uh, the desire to, to want to do it on a regular basis. It's difficult, but it's worth it. God's word is living. It is active. Amen. And it brings life to the believer whenever we engage with it, right? God's word does not return void, right? It does not have an empty, meaningless effect on people's lives. It changes us every time we are engaged with it. And so something to consider, something to think about in, in light of, 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 of where the world is going and in kind of where we see society going, not just here in America, but, but at the world at large. I want to ask you this question for you to think about because I've been thinking about it and it's pretty darn um, convicting when we say that I don't have time to spend in God's word you ever been there like man my, my day is full I, I get up at 5 a.m. and I go to bed at, at 11 and I'm, I'm working I'm pumping all day long I just don't have time but again, considering where we are as a society today, let me ask you, do you have time not to spend in God's Word? Do you really think that you are guaranteed that much time in this life to uh, get to it when you can, right? Uh, to figure it out later on in life. We'll come up with every excuse in the book not to be in God's Word. And how do I know that? Because I make it. <laughs> I make them all the time. And yet Jesus' high priestly prayer for this chosen people here in John 17 seems to suggest that we be saturated in God's word, that it literally defines every aspect of our lives. And there are going to be four kind of unique features of God's word that kind of contribute to its sanctifying power that we're going to consider today. So um, first in your outlines, we're just going to kind of look at the providence of God's word. Like it's providential nature um, plays a huge role in our sanctification. Notice what Jesus says back in verse 12. He says, While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So we know, because we've been going through this section, verse by verse, over the last three months, right, that who is that son of destruction? He's talking about Judas, right? Judas Iscariot is the one being referred to. And so according to Jesus, Judas Iscariot's betrayal was prophesied and it has now been fulfilled. What a specific prophecy for God to put on the heart of specifically a psalmist hundreds of years before this event would take place. Specifically, I want to draw your attention to Psalm 41 verse 9 which has been applied to Jesus. So this verse has been used by the New Testament writers to speak of Jesus. And the psalmist wrote this. 
Psalm 41, 9. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. One Old Testament prophecy that is now being fulfilled in time. And when Peter and the remaining disciples gathered um, after Jesus' ascension to heaven in Acts chapter 1, they, Peter and the, and, the, and the ten got together for the purposes of electing a, a new, like a, a twelfth apostle, a twelfth disciple to carry on and to begin the church. And they apply Old Testament scripture, specifically two more psalms, and they apply them directly to Judas. So Judas's betrayal is the fulfillment of Scripture. It's not a mistake. It's not like God didn't see that coming. He's like, oh, man, I didn't see that one. Uh, let me fix this real quick. Right? No, it was prophesied hundreds of years ago. You see, God's Word is laden with prophecies, many of which have providentially come to pass already, and it's all according to God's will. And when we read God's Word, we consider all the fulfilled prophecies not only do we get this kind of this profound picture of this divine nature of the scriptures, like it sets it apart from any other collection of writings, certainly, but we also get a rich treasury of, of examples of God's providence as it spans the course of history. God's providence is seen throughout his word. Look at the life of Jesus Christ himself. It has been estimated that during his 33 years on this earth, from his birth in a, in a manger in Bethlehem to his uh, ascension into heaven, his life and what he did, his ministry, fulfilled about 300 prophecies that were given in the Old Testament. Isn't that amazing? 33 years. How many prophecies have you fulfilled in your, in your lifetime? I'll, I'm, I'll wait. <laughs> Maybe one, and we're going to get to it next week um, at the end of John 17 when he talks about those who will come after the disciples. But this is just astounding that in just 33 years, that's literally like what, like 10, 10 prophecies a year that he's like, yep, there we go again. Um, he did it again, right? There goes another prophecy. This helps us to support the claims about the divine nature of Jesus. No other man in history could have ever pulled this off. Just a couple, let alone 300, right? But by extension, it also speaks to the divine nature of Scripture. And fulfilled prophecy is not only one of the greatest defenses for the Christian faith, but it serves as this timeless testimony to the faithfulness of God's providence. This is why it's so important to read the Old Testament and the New Testament, because if we become, the more we become familiar, the more we will start to recognize... By Isaiah. That was talked about by Oh my, how did they do that? And it just kind of brings everything to life, right? The providence of God is evident throughout his word. Secondly, God's word sanctifies us through its provision. Okay, through its provision. When Jesus reminded Satan in the desert that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He's talking about the spiritual provision that only God's word can give uh, to sustain our very lives. Physical sustenance is certainly important, right? Can I get an amen with the donuts in the morning, right? Like sometimes it's absolutely vital to get the donuts in the morning. But, but spiritual sustenance, right? Spiritual provision is way more vital to fighting off the schemes of the enemy. Amen? Donuts kind of maybe invite the enemy. I don't know sometimes. <laughs> But God's <laughs> don't comment on that. Yeah. <laughs> but God's word provides so much more than just protection against the enemy. Certainly it does, and that's what Jesus has been praying for. We're actually going to get to that in just a bit. But it actually provides all that our souls need to flourish, to enjoy life, to find pleasure in life, right? In verse 13, Jesus says this. But now I am coming to you. And these things I speak in the world, he's given his word, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. Absolutely amazing. Earlier in the evening, we remember from John 15, as he's talking about abiding in Christ, as the, as the uh, branch abides in the vine, it will bear much fruit. Why does he say these things? In John 15, verse 11, he says, he says, these things I have spoken to you, 
that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be what? Full. Full. He's seeking to provide full joy. There is this intrinsic connection between God's word and being filled with joy that can only come from the Savior and his word. Remember what Jesus says in these passages, right? That we are to be filled with his joy. Not the joy of the world, not the joy of money, not the joy of technology, certainly not the joy that comes from other people, right? It's God's joy that we are to be filled with, and that joy comes when we are saturated in his word. The Song of, da- uh, the song of David in Psalm 16 concludes with the, this amazing thought, and you guys know this uh, verse probably by heart, some of you. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. How can we objectively come to know God's path for our lives, but first and foremost through his word? This isn't a subjective feeling that we get. These aren't like, uh, it's not a burning in your bosom. It's not these, you know, these, these, these butterfly feelings. No. We, we, we're not persuaded by the opinions of others to, to tell us how, how to live. It's through God's word that he makes known to us the path of life. And as we spend more time in God's word, we are able to enjoy his presence, right? Even more so to a greater degree than if we are not in his words, in, in which there's fullness of joy. There's pleasures forevermore in his presence. That's the only way that the words of the old song that many of you probably know can actually come to life, right? I got the joy, 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 joy. What? Where? Oh, man, you guys are good. You guys are good. How do we get God's joy down in our hearts but by spending time in his word? Just by reading his word. And joy is this huge aspect of the life of the sanctified Christian. Right? How else can we endure? How else can we make sense of this crazy world that literally does not make sense anymore? But by remaining in God's word, by, by clinging to the provision of God's endless joy through Christ. That's what James can confidently talk about and write to his church that we read about in, in James' letter. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. You guys know this again. Count it all joy, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's the goal of our lives, is to be that. Guys, this is sanctification 101. This is, this is exactly what we're talking about, right? Being able to have joy in the midst of various trials. Only a sanctified person of God can do that, right? Right? knowing that the trials are effectively working together to make me more steadfast, more spiritually mature, more patient, more abounding in in the fruit of the Spirit. And you can say that the provision of God's joy in our lives is closely connected to this next aspect of our sanctification that Jesus is talking about. Third in your outlines, it's through the preservation. God's Word provides preservation. It sustains us, it preserves us, it keeps us through the trials of life and through the pressures of this world, right? Jesus says in verses 14 and 15, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Here Jesus is praying that that the word is directly connected to God's keeping, right, to his protection, to his preservation of his chosen people. That word keep is the same word that Jesus used uh, earlier in the text that we looked at last week in in, in, uh, verse 11 when he says, Holy Father, keep them in your name. Preserve them, protect them by your presence, by your power, by your authority, and by your word. And what are we preserved and protected from? Well, in these verses, apparently it's from the world and from the evil one who is the god of this world, right? He is the prince and the power of the air of this world. This means, first and foremost, if we are not of this world, that means we are aliens in a foreign land, right? We should not be so content in making this our home. 
This is not our home, amen? We are citizens of heaven before we are citizens of the U.S., before we're citizens of California, Calaveras County, Angels Camp, whatever. Not all of that is subservient to our citizenship in heaven. And I totally understand why people want to move out of the state. Like, it totally makes sense, right? For a, for a variety of reasons, but we're fooling ourselves if the world system and the God of this world sees Idaho or Texas or Tennessee and says, ah, I can't, they have like a hedge of protection around their state. I can't get through, right? That, that hedge of conservatism. Darn conservatives, I just, we'd be fooling ourselves if Satan cannot break and make his way into even those areas. Trust me, the enemy is moving into those areas, into those states. Maybe not to the extent that he is here, um, but he is. He is moving because he is the God of this world. And there will come a time when we can no longer run for greener pastures. And if we're still around, hope we're not, but if we are, what are we going to do then? How are we going to respond? If we're still around, then what, right? We have to remember conservative politics, uh, a good economy, capitalism. <laughs> those do not preserve us from the evil one. They do not make us not of this world. Only God and his word can do that. And so what's going to set us apart from the rest of the world, but our devotion, but our commitment to reading God's word, to obeying God's word, to trusting in God's word, that's what really makes us not of this world. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about, and it pains me, right? We talked about this a couple weeks ago, when so many people try to spend so much time being popular and liked and accepted by the world, and they forsake their own soul in the process, right? If we're in our Bibles, though, we realize I'm actually fighting against the inevitable. I'm fighting against the words of Christ himself by seeking to make this world my home. Francis Chan put it this way. Something is wrong when our lives make sense to unbelievers. I love that quote. I think we can extend that to the church. It's often been said, something is wrong when an unbeliever can come in here and feel completely at home and comfortable. Something's wrong. <laughs> I don't think Christ is being glorified, right? The gospel is not being proclaimed. If an unbeliever can be completely comfortable in a church service, we shouldn't desire so much to fit into the culture and to be liked and accepted and understood. We're not of this world, just as our Savior is not of this world, and it's his word that sustains us. It's his word that preserves us through the hardest of times. And then lastly, the sanctifying characteristics of God's word is grounded in principle. It's grounded in principle. So there's providence, there's provision, there's preservation, and lastly, there is principle. Jesus says in verses 17 through 19, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. God's word is truth. Notice the, the uh, John, or G John does not record Jesus saying, uh, God's word is true. As if there's this standard outside of God, and God's word just happens to line up with that standard of truth. No, God's word is the standard of truth. It is the embodiment of truth. This is why God's people are called to live according to principle. We should be people of principle, not people of feelings, not people of circumstances, although those have an effect on us, right? But we need to be first people of principle. When we live by principle... We live according to truth that exists outside of ourselves. So if my circumstance makes me feel a certain way, I have to, as a child of God, I have to line it up to God's truth and say, am, what am I feeling? Am, 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 am I, are my feelings or my thoughts true? And you know as well as I know, people are not doing that today. This is the single most amazingly awesome and simultaneously the most difficult aspect of being a follower of Jesus. It's the understanding that our lives, all of reality, is grounded in objective truth that is beyond you and me. 
we do not define it. And unfortunately, we live in this postmodern, this post-Christian society that no longer knows anything of principle, really. They are literally defined by personal feelings and experiences, right? This is now what determines right and wrong in the world that we live, right? How individuals feel about themselves. That's what defines reality and truth now. So anything is up for grabs, right? Men can be women. I didn't know if you knew that. I didn't know that. Women can be men. Children can self-identify as a cat or a dog. And schools must cater to that. Marriages can be virtually anything that makes you feel good with as many people as you want. Doesn't matter. And anyone who says differently is exercising their what? Their privilege. Their power over the oppressed. This is the world that we live in, guys. In fact, many within academia today, this is just mind-boggling, especially a, a guy who, like, I, I'm like a math nerd. I love math and the sciences. Many professors are now teaching that to know objective truth, like to say that you know objectively true, true things like in math and in, and in the sciences, did you know that that is an expression of white privilege, of white supremacy, and of patriarchy? So if my mom's in charge, one plus one does not equal two, right? Like what in, what in the world are we talking about? In fact, we are in the living out and the realization, maybe in a fuller sense, of what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 1. That people have suppressed the truth in their own sin and unrighteousness. And they have chosen to worship the creation rather than the creator. That is exactly what we are experiencing today. So I say to all our young people here today, listen to me when I, when I say this. There is objective truth, and do not let anybody tell you that. Don't let your teacher tell you that. Don't let TikTok and YouTube tell you that. No. There are true truths that are objectively true, whether you like it or not. It's not to be a bully about it. We shouldn't be unloving and gracious when we talk about it, but we have to be grounded in truth. And this is not a simple... You guys have heard it. Well, that's true for you. That's your truth. Right? That's your truth. I'm going to have my truth, and we're going to try to get along well, is that a true statement? Like, what, what in the world are we talking about, right? It's circular reasoning that always falls in upon itself. This is not a matter of my truth versus your truth. This is a matter, though, of man's truth versus God's truth. And what are we going to stand on today? What are we going to cling to? What are we going to look to to preserve us in the days ahead? And believe me when I say it, God's truth always wins out. I've tried to have my truth win out, and I failed every time. And this is the truth of God's word that provides the grounding for reality. It establishes the truth for the greatest questions of life. Because I don't care who you are, Muslim, Buddhist, religious, non-religious, atheist, whatever, we all struggle with these questions. Who am I? Where do I come from? Is there a God? What is my purpose in life? Where will I go when I die? Everybody is facing these questions on a daily basis. And unfortunately, they're believing lies from the world that feel good. And they're buying into them lock, stock, and barrel. Not only that, though, it is the truth of God's word that sanctifies us over time. It conforms us to the image of Christ. We live on principle. God's word gives us truth. It provides the ultimate authority over our lives. And that is how we progress in our sanctification. It's through truth. It's through truth. John MacArthur put it this way. I, I love this quote. He says, if Je this is great. Oh my God. I just love this, man. If Jesus, the sinless and perfect son of God, limited himself to speaking nothing during his incarnation, his life on earth, except the truth he received from his father, how much more should those who have been called into ministry speak only on the authority of the plain scripture? Obviously, he's speaking like in context about preachers and teachers, okay? Uh, pastors. But we can apply this truth to every single believer. Why? Because if you are born again, you have been called to ministry. 
Hear me when I say that. It's not just the pastor and the deacon and the worship leader. No, it is every single man, woman, and child who is born of God. You are called to ministry. You are called to minister truth in the lives of others. And how else could, if Jesus depended on the words of the Father, how much more should we depend on the truth of God's word? I have the fortune of being able to speak at um, chapel services every once in a while at, at CFLC, at, at Libertas Academy, um, and to just have this room filled with a couple hundred kids singing and, 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 and praising God. Um, but in, in one particular part of chapel, they begin chapel actually with the Pledge of Allegiance, right? Um, they begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, then they uh, uh, transition to the Pledge of the Christian Flag, and then they do a, a Pledge to the Bible. And they quote Psalm 119.105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know how profound it is on a Monday morning when sleep is still in my eyes <laughs> that I hear a couple hundred kids recite your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, I'm not so foolish to think that every single kid in here knows exactly what you're saying. Right? Certainly our kids here, right? I mean, certainly our kids here. <laughs> but isn't it profound that at such from a young age, these kids are being taught, what is, what is going to light your path? What is going to show you the way of life? It's God's word. It's his word. Jesus himself made this very clear in John 8, verses 31 and 32. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you Abiding in God's word. Truth. Freedom. That's what we want. That's what we were created for. And if you want to find real, lasting freedom in this life, you're not going to find it in your bank account. You're not going to find it in your job. You're not going to find it in your 401k. You're not going to find it in your family and friends. You certainly won't find it in the government, and you're not going to find it in this world. You and I can only experience real freedom by knowing truth. And we can only come to truth as much as we abide in Christ. And it's the truth of God's word that defines everything we live by. Jesus said at the end of this section in verse 19, right, that, that I consecrate myself so that they may be sanctified in truth as well. For what purpose? To be sent just as he was sent. Isn't that an amazing and profound responsibility that we have as believers of Jesus. It's not just to save you and forgive you of your sins, although praise God that that happens, but it's to send you out as Jesus was sent. What does that mean? To proclaim the good news of the gospel. To proclaim, guess what? The kingdom of God is at hand. We are here. And we've been called by our Lord to do a couple things that proclaim that truth throughout history until he comes back again. We know one of them is baptism, and the other one is communion, which we're going to celebrate as a family now together. So.